Welcome to Buried Secrets, a podcast about the paranormal, the occult, and weird and forgotten history. I'm Chris. All right, I am back from the break that I took, and I want to talk about some late 19th century UFO sightings, or possible UFO sightings. In 1897, there was a big UFO flap where all these people across the United States saw these airships. It was reported breathlessly in the news, and it's really interesting. I think it's especially interesting to me because so much UFO stuff is so closely tied to like the mid 20th century that it's cool to sort of dive into a much older UFO type flap. Also, last year I did a series about the story of the Goatman's Bridge or the Old Alton Bridge, which is in Denton County, Texas, where I grew up. While I was doing the research for that series, I came across a lot of weirdness in Denton. Denton is a place that is known for being haunted, and I know that there are multiple ghost tours that operate in the city of Denton, so the fact that there were hauntings there wasn't that surprising to me. However, I was fascinated by one thing that I stumbled across, which was that Denton was supposedly host to several mysterious airship sightings in 1897. So I made a note of that for a future episode but I didn't have time to go down that particular rabbit hole since I was deep in the Goatman's Bridge series. And that's kind of just been floating around in the back of my head as something interesting to look into sometime. Also, historically, I haven't talked about aliens or UFOs much at all on this podcast, but a series of synchronicities has led to me feeling like I need to dig into alien lore and history a little bit more. So last month, I started reading Jacques Vallée's famous 1969 book, Passport to Magonia. The book is all about the connections between fairy lore and UFO sightings, and it's absolutely fascinating. It's like a little bit embarrassing to be as into paranormal stuff as I am and to not have read this book until now, but I had heard so much about Passport to Magonia, that a lot of it felt very familiar to me. And it's a remarkable book to read because I can't imagine compiling the amount of information that he did about different sightings, both in folklore and in more modern times, in an era before the internet. And in fact, about half the book is just a list of hundreds of different sightings from the late 19th to the mid 20th century. And I can only imagine how valuable a resource that was prior to the internet. So it is completely unsurprising to me that the book is as iconic as it is. I ended up taking so many notes while reading it that it took me kind of a long time to finish. And I guess technically I'm still reading the tail end of some of the sightings that are in the end, but that's almost like an appendix. So I'm going to say that I finished it. I'm just reading through the extensive back matter at the moment. But it was so interesting because while I was reading it, I kept coming across different references to sightings that he talked about in his book. It happened with podcasts I was listening to, other books I was reading simultaneously, and it just goes to show how influential this book was that you can kind of turn on any paranormal media, at least the kind that I listen to and consume, And there will be specific references to these stories that he wrote about in 1969. It kind of feels like this seed that all this other stuff has grown out of. And these references to things that Valet talks about in this book came up so often that it almost felt like synchronicity. But again, I just think it's an indication of how significant and influential this book was and still is. And while I was reading, another thing that felt like synchronicity was the fact that the 1897 airship sightings that I had made a note of to talk about in a future episode came up a lot in the book. While the book doesn't talk about sightings in Denton, Texas, it does talk about some other nearby sightings that year. And when I was reading about some of these cases online, I also came across a UFO case in Aurora, Texas, which is a county next to Denton County. And this UFO case was so significant that it is now the thing that Aurora is known for. 
So in this episode, I want to talk about the 1897 airship flap in general, as well as the Aurora UFO crash. And then next time, I'll talk about the sightings in Denton County. But before we get into this specific case in Aurora, Texas, I want to look at how Valet describes some of the events of 1897 in Passport to Magonia. So I'm going to read a passage. It's a little bit long, but I think it just lays it out really well, kind of just like this group of events as a whole and kind of how many of them there were. It kind of gives you a sense of the scale and scope. So to read from the book, to present in an orderly fashion, all the accounts of that period would itself take a book. My object here is only to review the most detailed observations of the behavior of the airship's occupants on the ground. But first, how did the object itself behave? It maneuvered very much in the way UFOs are said to maneuver, except that airships were never seen flying in formation or performing aerial dances. Usually an airship flew rather slowly and majestically, Of course, such an object in 1897 ran no risk of being pursued, except in a few close proximity cases when it was reported to depart as shot out of a gun. Another difference from modern UFOs lies in the fact that its leisurely trajectory often took it over large urban areas. Omaha, Milwaukee, Chicago, and other cities were thus visited. Each time, large crowds gathered to watch the object. Otherwise, the airship exhibited all the typical activities of UFOs, hovering, dropping probes on Newton, Iowa on April 10th, for example, changing courses abruptly, changing altitude at great speed, circling, landing and taking off, sweeping the countryside with powerful light beams. And then he goes on to note, all the operators who engaged in discussions with human witnesses were indistinguishable from the average American population of the time. So there are several interesting things here. First, he points out that the UFOs seemed to be slow moving and didn't shy away from urban areas. That feels like a far cry from how many sightings are described nowadays, but his point about how transportation methods have changed since then feels important. Basically, the idea is that today we have technology that allows us to move very quickly in pursuit of any kind of flying object in the sky, but back then, theoretically, the idea of humans pursuing a UFO wouldn't be a concern. So potentially any extraterrestrial visitors could take their time and know that they weren't about to get chased down by, say, some jets, since airplanes weren't a thing yet. I also wonder how much of this has to do with the differences in technology from a practical standpoint. You know, people theoretically being able to chase slow moving aliens down or not being able to versus from a cultural standpoint. And what I mean by that is how much is the difference in sightings between then and now due to calculations on the part of the craft's pilots and how much of it is just due to society and how people perceive things at a certain point in time. So in a world where there aren't airplanes, A slow-moving object in the sky is remarkable and just about magical, so it's not like it needed to move fast to be impressive, right? So I'm curious how much of our experience of UFOs is about them, you know, the UFO or alien or whatever, and how much of it is about our own perception and the culture that we live in. In Passport to Magonia, Valet addresses that specifically. So to read a bit more, In the Flying Saucer Review, Jerome Clark observes that the 1897 wave indicates the futility of any attempt to divorce flying objects from the general situation in which they operate. This makes the study of such objects infinitely broader than the simple investigation, in scientific terms, of a new phenomenon. For, if the appearance and behavior of the objects are functions of our interpretation at any particular time in the development of our culture, then what chances can we have of ever knowing the truth? I really love this question. I personally am not interested in the nuts and bolts interpretation of UFOs. I like weird, paranormal, and magical interpretations of UFOs, which is probably one of many reasons why I like Passport to Magonia so much, because it's kind of folkloric ideas about UFOs and connections between the two. And it's just fascinating to me how our perception of UFOs changes over time. And I guess you could probably say that about our perception of the paranormal in general. It would be really interesting to kind of plot out 
the differences between paranormal experiences at different points in time, especially because back in the day, like, you know, a really long time ago, it seems like paranormal things were kind of more accepted and magic was more a part of daily life. And that's sort of changed a lot. Anyway, I know I'm going on a digression. I'll stop now. I don't actually have data about that. It's just an interesting thing to think about. And maybe I'll research it some other time. So anyway, let's get back to these airships. The mystery airship wave began in 1896 in California. And then after that, reports began to appear throughout the country, apparently moving eastward. Some of the sightings seemed to be unidentified lights, but a lot of them sounded like dirigibles or airships. And again, typically the reports said that the pilot seemed basically human. It sounds like a lot of people thought these airships were the work of some genius inventor. So apparently, so many people thought that Thomas Edison was behind these mystery airships that he actually had to issue a statement saying that he was not involved. That being said, there were also some people who thought that the airships had flown here from Mars. And that was a theory that came up around the Aurora, Texas UFO crash as well. While some airships had been flown before this flap, there weren't existing airships at the time that were able to maneuver the way these crafts moved. At the time, some skeptics tried to claim that these were just hoaxes and pranks, or that people were hallucinating, or that they were seeing huge swarms of fireflies and thinking they were airships. The firefly thing kind of makes me laugh because it makes me think of how skeptics claim that for multiple cryptids, people aren't actually seeing the cryptid, they're seeing the sandhill crane. I think that came up with both the Jersey Devil and the Mothman. Anyway, maybe some people were seeing enormous swarms of fireflies, but I don't think that can account for all of these sightings. Also, it is worth noting, this is, you know, journalism in the 19th century. It, to me, definitely seems like there could have been some yellow journalism going on here because this was the era of making up stories to sell newspapers. So do I think that all of the 1897 airship sightings were made up? No, absolutely not. Do I think that some of them were? Yeah, why not? It feels like if the airship sightings were getting reported on and people were interested in them and they were selling newspapers, then there would be a real incentive for manufacturing additional sightings. So that's something to keep in mind as well. All right, so let's get to this UFO crash in Aurora, Texas. Despite being from the area, I had not been familiar with Aurora at all before doing this research. I had literally never heard of it. Just for geographical reference, the town is about 20 miles northwest of Dallas. So, you know, it's in the DFW area. But unlike a lot of places in the DFW area, Aurora is a small town of only about 1,400 people as of 2020. People know about Aurora because of the UFO crash, which happened in April of 1897. Local legend has it that the pilot of the UFO was even buried in the local cemetery. Interestingly, the town seems to have embraced the urban legend. According to Wikipedia, at some point, the website for the city mentioned the UFO story and contained images of an alien. But when I went to the city website, I guess they updated it. There's no mention of the alien, though there is a image of a windmill in the city logo, which will be important later. But if you Google Aurora, Texas, you can still see a more far out sort of logo. Online, there is a town logo, which looks like a sort of stenciled serif type, and then it has some swirls. And then one of those swirls or swoops on the logo leads up to the UFO, almost as if it's a trail left by the UFO. And then in small type down below, it says, a legendary Western town. I think that is very fanciful and fun. And also in the picture that I saw, the logo is printed on a billboard, and then there's a sort of metal UFO sculpture next to a sculpture of a windmill and a cutout of an alien waving or maybe flashing a peace sign, it was a little bit hard to tell in the picture. So at least at some point, there was a version of the town logo that had the UFO on it. I don't know what the story is behind what looks like the rebranded city website, but maybe people just wanted to, the city to take itself more seriously. There's also a historical marker 
outside the town cemetery, which includes a mention of the UFO, as well as some of the town's other tragedies. In reading this, I noticed that there were a lot of bad moments in the town's history, and I wondered whether the story of the UFO was sort of just a nicer way to connect to and be proud of the town's history. I recently read an excellent article in Smithsonian Magazine by Joseph P. Laycock about cryptid festivals and small towns with tragic histories. It's a fascinating article and it ties cryptid festivals into medieval pilgrimages and kind of like the parallels that some of the beliefs today have with religious beliefs back in the day. It's a great article. You should read it. I'll link it in the show notes at buriedsecretspodcast.com. But I wanted to read just a little bit of this article. Well, it's kind of a longish excerpt, but I think it's worth it just because I think something similar might be at play here. So reading from the article. To me, what makes monster festivals strange are not the creatures they celebrate, but rather the way they facilitate the intermingling of cultures that have traditionally defined themselves in opposition to each other. The conventional wisdom is that struggling small towns should appeal to a nostalgic time, when America was more conservative, more Christian, and simpler, not stranger. To be sure, monster festivals always attract local families with smiling children. But to bring in tourism dollars, they have to draw other elements not easily reconciled with what architecture professor Kieran J. Maker calls the myth of Main Street. There certainly exists what might be called a cryptozoology tribe that turns out for these festivals. Cryptid fan culture has heavy overlap with horror movie fans, conspiracy theorists, and a psychobilly aesthetic. Black t-shirts, tattoos, and patches for the misfits abound. These eccentric tastes may be part of the reason small towns usually don't invest in monster festivals until they have to. The mutation of monsters from bizarre police reports into emblems of the community seems to go hand in hand with the destruction of small town economies by the forces of globalization and urbanization. And then later the article talks about how these festivals also offer a way to educate people about the community and for outsiders to see the community as something more than just its struggles. So I wanted to read one more line from this. So. At the same time, these festivals draw middle-class urbanites like myself who want to learn more about places that many Americans have forgotten about or fail to understand. While there isn't, to my knowledge, a UFO-related festival in Aurora, their UFO sculpture has a similar vibe to me, right? There's this idea of celebrating this weird part of the area's history. So I wanted to read a little bit from the historical marker just to give a sense of some of the not so great parts of the area's history. And this is just an excerpt. An epidemic which struck the village in 1891 added hundreds of graves to the plot. Called spotted fever by the settlers, the disease is now thought to be a form of meningitis. Located in Aurora Cemetery is the gravestone of the infant Nellie Burris, 1891 to 1893, with its often quoted epitaph, as I was so soon done, I don't know why I was begun. This site is also well known because of the legend that a spaceship crashed nearby in 1897, and the pilot killed in the crash was buried here. Struck by epidemic and crop failure and bypassed by the railroad, the original town of Aurora almost disappeared, but the cemetery remains in use with over 800 graves. The marker is just so wild to me because it's, you know, a very serious list of sad things. And then in the middle, it mentions this UFO, which is also a sad thing, right? Because like the pilot died, but it's just interesting. So the story goes that in April of 1897, in the middle of this big flap of UFO sightings around the country, a UFO came to Aurora which at that time was an even smaller town than it is now, with a population of 237 people. So apparently, the craft was damaged, so it was only able to go maybe 10 to 12 miles an hour, and it was losing altitude. It went over the public square, and then it hit the windmill of one Judge Proctor. The whole thing exploded and scattered debris everywhere. It also destroyed the windmill and water tank and also the judge's flower garden. There were some descriptions of the alien remains, 
According to the original article, he was, quote, badly disfigured from the accident, but they were able to see well enough or like see enough of him to believe that he was not from Earth. So I guess something was weird about his appearance, but it doesn't say what. And a local signal service officer claimed that the alien was from Mars. I also saw something about papers with a sort of hieroglyphic type text being found on the pilot's body, though fewer accounts had that detail. And the craft was made out of an unknown metal that looked kind of like a mix of silver and aluminum, and it was said to weigh several tons, probably. Everyone from the whole area came out to see the crash, and then they held a funeral for the pilot the next day. Some accounts said that the craft was shaped like a cigar and then it had a bright light. Before I move on from the original account, I do want to note that if the craft weighed several tons, and the implication that I get from everything I read was that the craft was buried with this guy, then that would have been a lot to move and bury. So that's a little bit of a strange inconsistency, maybe. So anyway, in 1973, a reporter named Jim Mars visited the Aurora Cemetery and tried to find the grave of the pilot. I just realized as I was reading that out loud that it's very funny that this reporter was named Jim Mars. Like it's spelled M-A-R-R-S. But since some people claim that the UFO was from Mars, that's either a weird synchronicity or maybe something's being made up here. Like it feels very convenient, but it could also be weird and synchronistic. I don't know. Anyway, Jim Mars said that he thought he had found the grave and it was just a rough headstone made out of rock and half of it was missing. But he said that on the half that remained, there was a carved design that looked like one side of a saucer with little portholes. So like the standard flying saucer image, which is a bit odd, you know, like this standard 20th century flying saucer. You know, if the tombstone was supposed to have dated from the 19th century, that's a bit odd, although maybe it was replaced or something. I don't know. Anyway, he said that the grave was not full size, but it was the size of a child or a smaller person's grave. Another journalist went and brought a metal detector to the grave and said he suspected that it contained, quote, at least three large pieces of metal. Later on, though, the same journalist went back to the grave with a metal detector again, and he couldn't detect anything anymore. He said that a metal pipe had been stuck into the ground, and it sounds like he suspected that someone had maybe used that to get the metal pieces out of the grave, though I have no idea how that would work. Also, if the pieces of metal were the debris from the craft, and the craft weighed several tons, and it was a child-sized grave, how did it all fit into the grave unless maybe they didn't bury all of the craft? I don't know. There's a lot of details that like don't quite add up, but of course we're talking about an urban legend. So it's always possible that aspects of it are invented and it's always possible that details are lost and have kind of become incorrect in the retelling. So who knows? Then sometime in the 1970s, someone stole the grave marker and the grave's location was lost. Folks have used radar to find an unmarked grave in that general area where people think he was buried, but the Aurora Cemetery Association says that they don't want researchers to exhume the grave, which to be honest, I think is totally fair. So over the years, there have been different debunkings. There is one theory that the 1897 flap in general was actually caused by a secret society of human airship builders who were based in California called the Sonora Aero Club. Apparently the club was kept secret for decades and only came to light when someone found cool drawings of airships in an antique store in Houston in the 1960s. There is a 2004 book that I have not read, but that sounds really interesting, called Solving the 1897 Airship Mystery by Michael Busby. So check that out for details. It's worth noting, however, that the existence of the club itself is up for debate. The Atlantic published an article about it in 2013 called The Airship Club That Might Never Have Existed, and it gives a basic rundown of the supposed club, which sounds a little 
It kind of just sounds like a bunch of people gathered together to like hang out and talk about maybe building an airship. But in the interest of full disclosure, the article is paywalled and it doesn't look like I can access it through any of the New York Public Library's newspaper databases or anything. So I wasn't able to read the entire article, though I would love to. It sounds very interesting. But I wanted to read a little bit of the article that I was able to read because it paints a really interesting picture of this club. So to read from that, they called themselves the Sonora Aero Club, and over time they counted some 60 members, possibly many more. Their ranks included great characters such as Peter Menace, inventor of the club's secret lifting fluid, later described as, quote, a rough man, wit as kind a heart as to be found in very few living beings, despite being, quote, addicted to strong drink and, quote, flat broke. The Arrow Club's rules? Roughly once a quarter, each member had to stand before the gathered group and, quote, thoroughly exercise their jaws in telling how he would build an airship. So yeah, to me, this doesn't necessarily sound like a brilliant club of geniuses who were able to build these sophisticated airships secretly without anyone finding out that they were the ones behind all these airship sightings. Seems very unlikely to me, and it also seems like something that the club might want to take credit for. But again, I don't know that much about the club. Another story goes that S.E. Hayden, the man who first wrote the article about the crash in 1897, just made it up. According to a 1979 Time Magazine article, an 86-year-old resident named Edda Pegu, Pegu I don't, I don't know how her name is pronounced, said, Hayden wrote it as a joke and to bring interest to Aurora. The railroad bypassed us and the town was dying. People wish so hard the story was true they really start believing it. Why, the judge never even had a windmill. So, yeah, who knows? Maybe the entire thing was made up. Maybe not. If you do the math, the woman who's quoted in this article would have only been about four years old at the time of the crash. So, probably just believed whatever her parents told her. So who knows? I'm not saying she's lying. I'm not saying Hayden was lying. This is an urban legend situation where it seems like there are a bunch of different versions of what might have happened. But in the end, whether or not Hayden made it up to draw attention to the town, it did give Aurora, Texas its own sort of mythology and it tied it in to this thing that was happening nationally. You know, there's this huge flap and it does feel significant that a small town like Aurora could, you know, have its own part in this larger story that's happening all around the country. And I think that's equally true and interesting, whether or not a UFO actually crashed there. You know, urban legends are a way to mythologize the world around us, and I think they make the world a lot more interesting. Interestingly, this case is actually well known enough to have inspired a 1986 movie about it called The Aurora Encounter, which I have not seen, but looks very cheesy and fun. So if that's up your alley, that exists. And a quick source note, a lot of the info in this episode came from a great article in TexasHillCountry.com, which I will include in the show notes. So check that out for more info. It is a really interesting read. Like I said, next time I'm going to talk about some more 1897 airship sightings in North Texas, so stay tuned for that. Oh, and before I close the episode, I wanted to talk about a thing that I am doing that I have challenged myself to do, which is I am writing a blog post every weekday. I started doing it a couple weeks ago, and it's kind of inspired by a lot of different things including one of my favorite writers and thinkers, Cory Doctorow, who writes a daily blog post and who has talked about how forcing yourself to write something and publish it every day or, you know, five days a week, every weekday, really forces you to articulate your ideas and develop them better. And it helps you see connections in your thinking. It helps you flesh things out. And I am a fan of the Zettelkasten note-taking method, which is sort of similar to that. It involves 
taking atomized notes from everything that you're reading and watching and listening to and expanding upon each of those and sort of finding the ways in which they connect. I'm not doing an amazing job of describing Zettelkasten, but I'll probably end up writing a blog post about it sometime because it's something that I am a fan of. But anyway, I am publishing these week daily blog posts on my website, on Medium, and on Substack. So I know, I think last time I was like, yeah, I want to try to send out one Substack newsletter every month. And then probably two days later, like before I even published that episode, I got the idea to do this daily blog post thing. So that tends to be how I am. I come up with a idea and then run with it. So if you want a dispatch from me every weekday, you can sign up on my Substack, which is linked on my website, barrytickespodcast.com. If not, you can just go to my website or my Medium page, which is also linked on my website. And I'm kind of using the blog to work out ideas for the podcast, but also sort of expand into other things. So I'm kind of positioning it as being about the paranormal and other things that haunt us. So it's not strictly just about paranormal stuff. I'm also writing about technology, nostalgia, creativity, kind of just like the stuff I'm interested in. So I've written a handful of episodes about nostalgia and ghost hunting and different ghost hunting tools and how they kind of resemble old technology. I imagine that'll end up turning into an episode at some point. The general vibe that I'm going for with my blog posts is similar to my episode on Mylar Balloons and Forgotten Futures that I published last year, which might be my favorite episode that I've done. And if you haven't listened to it, that episode is a bit of a departure from my usual podcast topics because it's about imagination and how being into the paranormal means that you have a imagination and you're willing to kind of think of novel ideas and alternatives to kind of like consensus reality. And that makes it also easier for you to imagine better futures. And, you know, things look pretty grim a lot of the time. And it is important to be able to imagine a better world. So, you know, I talk about Mylar Bloons and the paranormal. I talk about, you know, what it is to be interested in paranormal things. But it's not like a straightforward historical deep dive or something like that. It really is like a more like philosophical sort of thing. It kind of is like veering into other topics that I'm also interested in. And, you know, I'm really interested in solar punk things. And that episode talks about like solar punk concepts and that sort of thing. So there will definitely be stuff kind of in that realm on the blog. And yeah, you can definitely expect a lot of tech related stuff. You know, I've been writing a lot about paranormal investigation gear and nostalgia because I'm really interested in old tech and tech related nostalgia. I'm one of those people who spends hours watching YouTube videos of people like taking apart computers from the 90s and like getting them to work again or like booting them up and being like, look at what Windows 98 used to look like. Remember this? Which is not at all about the paranormal necessarily, but nostalgia and our past and history is a thing that haunts us. And I'm very interested in exploring that on its own and also in exploring it in relation to the paranormal. So yeah, you can expect a lot of tech related stuff and places where that kind of intersects with some of the stuff that I talk about in the podcast. Another thing that I'm working on right now, kind of like an ongoing project this year, is I really want to learn how to make some paranormal investigation gear. So I taught myself how to solder this month. I'm not very good at it, but you know, I'm working on improving. And last weekend I made a very bare bones version of a REM pod just from the popular Mad Lab theremin kit that a lot of people use as like a DIY REM pod. 
So I have multiple write-ups about that on the blog. And I want to kind of chronicle my learning related to that. I'm also kind of trying to chronicle some of the other projects I'm working on, both related to the podcast and the paranormal and not. So if you liked that episode on Mylar Balloons and Forgotten Futures, if any of these things sound interesting to you, or if you just like hearing from me, you can sign up for the newsletter, you can read the blog on the website, and definitely some things from the blog are going to end up congealing into episodes. You know, since a big motivation behind blogging daily is to build out some of my ideas. Like I've been thinking over these ideas of nostalgia and retro tech in the paranormal and also things like junk space and internet aesthetics and liminal space and all these different things. And I've been kind of just like crunching them around in my head or like, I don't know, swirling them around in my head, trying to come up with an episode about them. And it hasn't quite solidified into something, but already from just a couple weeks of blogging, I'm like starting to see the pattern and starting to see how it all fits together. So I've been having a lot of fun doing it. I've gotten some nice responses to the stuff I've been writing. So check that out if it is of interest. Other than that, I am now on Mastodon. Technically, I've been on it since January, but I keep forgetting to mention it. But I have become much more active on Mastodon, and I'm trying to kind of not phase out my Instagram. I'm still on Instagram. I still get you know message notifications, and, st and I'm still posting on there. But I'm really trying to focus more on Mastodon and interactions there versus Instagram. So if you want to follow me on Mastodon, you can do that at Buried Secrets Podcast at weirdo.network. And weirdo.network, the server that I'm on, is really awesome. It's run by the folks at Liminal Earth, who I've mentioned before. And it's just a really cool and great community. So if you're not on Mastodon, I highly recommend that you join. I totally see why people like the Fediverse so much. Oh, and if you don't know what the Fediverse is, it's basically like a group of interoperable social media platforms that are not centralized. So for example, Mastodon is one part of the Fediverse and it has these different servers or instances that are run by different people. Like you could set one up just for yourself if you wanted. And each of these instances has its own mods, its own rules, its own block lists, etc. And it's kind of a way to have a social media experience that's not controlled by an algorithm, by huge corporations, that's not, you know, hiding the stuff you're interested in from the people you want to follow and, you know, feeding you ads and stuff. You know, there's no ads at all. And the cool thing about it is it's all interoperable. You can, you know, if you don't like the server you join, you can export everyone you follow and everyone who follows you and move to a different server and keep all of that. It's not like, you know, you leave Twitter or Instagram and you lose all the followers you've built up there. And the other cool thing is that, you know, I'm talking about Mastodon, which is kind of like the Twitter of the Fediverse, but there's also a version of Instagram, basically, which is the same. It's the same deal where, you know, it's hosted on different servers. It's not centralized. And it's cool because you can be on Mastodon, but your friend might be on the Instagram version, you know, the Fediverse version of Instagram, which if I recall correctly is called PixelFed. But basically you could be on Mastodon, someone else could be on PixelFed, but you can follow them from your Mastodon account. And, you know, there's all different platforms basically that are all connected and you can follow people on all the different platforms. It's it's just really cool. A lot of people have compared it to what the internet used to be like. So I guess, you know, and speaking of retro tech and nostalgia about technology, it really does feel like what the internet used to feel like. People are like super nice, super interesting. And yeah, it's just really great. So I recommend that you join Mastodon and or other parts of the Fediverse. And if you do, please connect with me 
at buriedsecretspodcast at weirdo.network. All right, so that's my spiel about Mastodon and my spiel about how I'm blogging now. Like I said, I still am on Instagram, so if you want to follow me there, you can follow me at Buried Secrets Podcast. You can email me at buriedsecretspodcast at gmail.com. If you liked this episode, please rate and review on whatever podcatcher you use. Please tell your friends about it. Oh, and the show notes are at buriedsecretspodcast.com. There you can find the episode scripts, all of my sources, and of course, now my mini blog posts. All right, I think that's all I've got. Until next time, thanks so much for listening.